Theology in view. Now, a title like A Reformed Critique of Limited Atonement will almost certainly cause some of my Reformed brothers to squint their eyes in deep suspicion. A few may even be preparing to enter Hulk mode, whereupon they will promptly grab the jawbone of a donkey and, like Samson of old, attempt to thrash me into a cowering pulp of semi-Pelagianism. We know that you are merely a Sith Lord cloaked in the garments of Calvinism. Well, let me assure you from the start that I am a black coffee Calvinist, and I regularly imagine myself at the Council of Dort sniffing tulips while heartily signing the document. The reason why some of my Reformed brothers will react so strongly to the mere thought of my critiquing limited atonement is because they think that there is only one truly Reformed perspective on the subject. In this respect, their taxonomy is a bit truncated. Here's how they imagine the situation. Picture a circle on the right. This represents the view known as limited atonement. Somewhere over on the left is the circle of Arminianism. If you do not hold to their conception of limited atonement, then wittingly or unwittingly, you slide over to the Arminian side. Now the dirty little secret is that many assume that something like John Owen's particular brand of limited atonement, a more strict form of particularism, one might say, is the default position. That view alone enjoys the place of creedal acceptability. Only strict particularism can bathe in the vibrant light of reformed orthodoxy. But this taxonomy is too reductionistic. A more accurate picture of the situation looks something like this. Let's draw the circle on the right again, but make it smaller. This circle represents strict particularism. This view reinterprets the formula sufficient for all, efficient for the elect, and some don't even utilize it. They also frown upon those who understand passages like 1 Timothy 2.4 to mean all men without exception, or those who understand John 3.16 to mean, well, what John 3.16 seems to be saying. Folks in this camp just might have a tattoo of John Owen hidden somewhere under their beard. We can now draw a few other circles to the left. One would be Emeraldianism, one would be four-point Calvinism, and another would be hypothetical universalism. All three of these camps disagree with the peculiarities of strict particularism. Emeraldians kind of do their own thing with the decree and as such fall into their own peculiar category. I see many four-pointers as actually hypothetical universalists who simply aren't aware of the historical categories. They don't know what to call themselves, and so they unwittingly intimate that they deny limited atonement. The truth is that many just disagree with strict particularism and concede the idea of L to the guys on the right. Lastly, there are the hypothetical universalists. This would be essentially my camp, broadly speaking. This group wants to maintain that Christ's death is presently sufficient for all, but efficient only for the elect. Think Davenant, Usher, Bollinger, Wolfgang, Musculus, Ursinus, Baxter, and the like. The esteemed historian Richard Muller says, the non-speculative, non-Emeraldian form of hypothetical universalism was new in neither the decades after Dort, nor a softening of the tradition. The views of Davenant, Usher, and Preston followed out a resident trajectory long recognized as orthodox among the Reformed. Now there's one other very large circle to consider. This is where most modern-day Calvinists land. At the risk of sounding rude, one might describe at least some of the folks here as the muddled middle. Perhaps it would be better to say the vague middle or ambiguous majority, or just the middle, whatever. Essentially, these are the Calvinists who aren't terribly familiar with the once familiar distinctions debated in the 17th and 18th century. They harbor elements of strict particularism, but often adopt other strands from the more moderate camps. For example, they will typically view Owen's trilemma with admiration and advance the double jeopardy argument with vigor. But they will sometimes claim that Christ's death is presently sufficient for all as a ground for the universal gospel offer. They may or may not interpret passages like 1 Timothy 2.4 and 2 Peter 3.9 like a strict particularist. Someone like John Piper seems quite happy, for example, to say that God desires the salvation of all men in one sense. See his article, Are There Two Wills in God? 
In contrast, a strict particularist like James White will fight to the grave, arguing that such passages are only dealing with classes of people and little more. It's ultimately about the elect. Given that many of our popular modern treatments of the subject fail to properly and fairly demarcate the key reform debates of old and tend to assume Owen's general schematic, such tendencies aren't terribly surprising, though unfortunate. Here I would encourage one to compare and contrast how Dabney, Charles Hodge, Shedd, Turretin, Burkhoff, Raymond, Grudem, Horton, and other systematics tackle the issue. Differences will emerge. Set something like D.A. Carson's The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God against other modern reform treatments and you will find subtle but significant differences. Here's an example. Someone like Robert Raymond will labor in his systematic to restrict the scope of passages like 2 Timothy 2.4, John 3.16, and 2 Peter 3.9 to basically the elect alone. Commenting on 2 Peter 3.9, Raymond says, Clearly the referent of his any is the Christian elect to whom he has been speaking, and his all refers to the elect of God in their entirety. To argue to the contrary, that is, and then quoting Owen, to argue that because God would have none of those to perish, but all of them to come to repentance, therefore he hath the same will and mind towards all and every one in the world, even those to whom he never makes known his will, nor ever calls to repentance, if they never once hear of his way of salvation, comes not much short of extreme madness and folly. Here one would certainly want to quibble with, he hath the same will and mind? Piper would want to disagree, for example. Nevertheless, compare Raymond's general frame of thinking with Carson. Here's what Carson says. I argue, then, that both Arminians and Calvinists should rightly affirm that Christ died for all, in the sense that Christ's death was sufficient for all, and that Scripture portrays God as inviting, commanding, and desiring the salvation of all out of love, in the third sense developed in the first chapter. Further, all Christians ought also to confess that, In a slightly different sense, Christ Jesus, in the intent of God, died effectively for the elect alone, in line with the way the Bible speaks of God's special selecting love for the elect, in the fourth sense developed in the first chapter. See the difference? Now when we step back and consider this larger reform picture, it should be stressed that the circles represent early reform thought, and when it comes to subscribing to Dort, or even the Westminster Confession of Faith, there is room for shades of Calvinistic opinion on the extent of the atonement. This means, therefore, that when I say I'm going to present a reform critique of limited atonement, I am saying that I'm going to engage in an in-house debate and critique some of the weaknesses of the strict particularist view. It is one reform strand of thought versus another reform strand of thought. It will be, one might say, a bit of Davenant versus Owen, or Carson versus Raymond, or, or what have you. With this in mind, in the upcoming videos, we're going to look at the sufficient for all, efficient for the elect formula, and ask whether or not the strict particularist paradigm can ground a genuine, well-meant, universal gospel offer. In the meantime, you might want to check out a few resources. Till next time.